Dear all, welcome to another Anamed Library Talks organized by the Anamed Library. Our guests today are Mustafa Erdem Kabadayi and Kerem Tınaz. The title of this talk is Urban Occupations, OETR, a Geospatial Humanities Project aiming to map and examine long-term changes in economic and population geography in Southeast Europe and Turkey. In this talk, Mustafa Erdem Kabadayi will discuss this project. He will share his experiences in building a large multi-expertise team that work for one methodological aim, which is to bring Ottoman and Turkish history to digital humanities. And today's talk will be moderated by Kerem Tınaz. Before passing to the talk, I would like to introduce you our guests. Our speaker, Mustafa Erdem Kabadayı, is Associate Professor of Economic History and History of Economic Thought at Koç University. The economic and labor history of the Ottoman Empire has been central to his research agenda. Since 2016, as the principal investigator of Urban Occupations, OETR, an ERC standing grant project, he is pursuing his academic career further as an economic historian, focusing on the Ottoman Empire, Bulgaria, Greece, and Turkey by using geospatial humanities methods. The moderator of this talk, Kerem Tınaz, is assistant professor of history at Koç University, where he also teaches courses on the history of Ottoman Empire and Turkey. His research focuses on the intellectual and cultural history of the late Ottoman Empire with a particular interest in identity, ideology and networks. Last but not least, I would like to inform all our attendees that their cameras and microphones are automatically closed. Please type your questions in the chat section. And at the end, the moderator will ask your questions in the Q&A section. Thank you all for being here. And now I'm passing the word to Kerem Tınaz. Thank you, Defne Hanım. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Anamet Library Talks. I'm Kerem Tınaz. And as Defne Hanım stated, I will be moderating today's talk. Uh, today, we are privileged to have my dear colleague, Erdem Kabadayı, with us. Uh, he, will be, he will be talking about the ERC project urban occupations, which he has been running as the project's principal investigator since 2016. Um, before I yield the floor to Erdem Hoca, I would like to say a few words about the project in order to highlight that urban occupations is one of the most important ongoing research projects within Ottoman studies for several reasons. And, and the fact that urban occupations is the first social sciences and humanities project funded by ERC in Turkey is testament to this. ERC grants, as you all know, are uh, extremely competitive. And this achievement highlights the place of the project in social sciences and the humanities in uh, Turkey. Um, in general, urban occupations focuses on urban growth and industrialization from 1850 to 2000 and brings together economic, uh, social and urban history. Uh, one aspect of the project that I want to particularly uh, highlight is its contribution to Ottoman studies and uh, digital humanities, which is a rising field in academia, I believe. Uh, more and more universities across the world are beginning to recognize the uh, potential of the use of digital tools, uh, digital tools in the humanities and uh, social sciences. And also, uh, more and more scholars are uh, beginning to think how the use of these tools can benefit, expand, but also transform the ways we do uh, research. And uh, urban occupations stands out as one of the first and most comprehensive uh, initiatives for studies in Ottoman and Turkish history that seriously engage with digital humanities. In the last five years, it has brought together dozens of researchers with different skills and backgrounds to contribute to the uh, project. Uh, in other words, I think, uh, it's important to recognize that with its aim and scale, uh, the project is a pioneer in the field. 
And uh, since 2016, the project has had numerous outcomes ranging from new uh, digital data and maps to articles, conference presentations, uh, workshops. And for these contributions, uh, I believe the project deserves acknowledgement with bold uh, letters. And uh, luckily since 2018, I had the chance to visit the project offices and observe them at work. It was truly a great uh, lesson in academic effort, collaboration, and uh, research. And this evening, I'm excited to hear Adam just talk about the project, maybe learn about its new outcomes, but also understand better the methods, stories, and uh, background of the uh, project. So uh, before uh, I give the floor to Erdemoja. I want to remind everyone about the format of today's talk. Erdemoja will be talking about the project for about 50 minutes. Uh, the talk will be followed by Q&A uh, session. If you have any question, please write them in the uh, chat box. I will forward the questions uh, to Erdemoja. So, uh, Without further ado, uh, Ardem uh, thank you very much uh, for being with us and welcome again. And the stage is yours. Thanks for this extremely friendly introduction. Uh, very kind uh, to hear these uh, words. And uh, also I would like to thank to Anamed surely for the invitation to share my experiences uh, about running a large-scale project. So when I was asked to give this talk, uh, I thought about what to report. And since this has been a large-scale academic undertaking, uh, I thought I'll try to give not uh, specific results, which we have uh, a few, but on the journey, to be honest, uh, that we've been going through in the last five years. Therefore, uh, what you will be hearing and seeing will be the mainly the challenges we faced and changes we've gone through or the, let's say, uh, cures and remedies we've tried to solve. And therefore, it is not an academic presentation with results, uh, but it's mainly an experience sharing. And I hope this will uh, serve the interest. Uh, of the participants. Now, uh, it's a long title, and sorry about that, uh, but it's been a long project and so it's a large project. A uh, very quick note on ERC, uh, thanks to Kerem's introduction. Uh, probably you are, either you are familiar with it or probably you've heard about that before, but the European Research Council grants uh, are very advantageous grants. Uh, how difficult are they to get them is something else, but if you have one, it is an advantage. Uh, and before I start, let me just underline this um, loose financial and administrative policing, or not policing is the right, right word, but uh, regulations. Uh, and they're on purpose uh, that you've got free hand. So when you have an ERC project, um, the very first reporting about the academic progress is of, in the 13th month. So in the very first 30 months, no one from ERC is asking about the progress that you are making in the academic front. And even that mid-term report is very brief. I've run smaller projects regarding the budget, but the reporting exercise is totally different here. So it is on purpose uh, a very um, liberal project. And you, you only report twice your academic uh, progress. Uh, which is in the middle of it and at the end of it. And even financially, it is a really um, a very advantageous project. I just wanted to highlight. This. So for among other reasons, this one, the academic liberty and having the means to work on a topic that you are really interested in is a key distinguishing uh, of ER sequence. I would just like to highlight that. And now I'll slowly move in to the project and I will be sharing my screen and um, Kerem is helping me in this regard. I'll be focusing on my screen, but if you face any technical difficulties caused by me, 
So if you cannot see my screen, please write in the chat box to Kerem. I'm sure uh, they will sort it out. But this is important because I will be showing things. So if something is not working, please let us know. Uh, that can be a problem because the design of this talk is rather a uh, visually based one. Okay, now I already mentioned this. Uh, we are in the last year of the project due to the COVID um, disruptions. So we've got an extension for a year. So we will be working on this project until the end of September, 2022. And um, FAIR is the new data principles. I've just put them there. So um, at the end of the day, not now, we've already started to work on this, but when we finish this project, there will be open data sets, which will be used for other researchers. And this is quite important, especially if you think about the perspective of the digital humanities or geospatial humanities. And I'll try to mention this with some specific examples. So interdisciplinary team, I mean, interdisciplinary is a buzzword. Sometimes people use this just it sounds because it sounds nice. Uh, but in our case, it was a journey. So uh, when I've designed the project, um, I've thought that we will be, you know, historians working on an history project with two guides. So one guy, guide number one, I knew from the beginning that we would have a computer scientist to create data entry tools, etc and a GIS person. Um, it is almost derogatory, but I'm not saying like this. So I'm an expert in geospatial humanities, but I'm a GIS person. But we ended up in a different interdisciplinary mix. And this is, I think, the complete list of people who had proven capabilities in these fields. We ended up in this way. We haven't started in this way, but the, the team has become more interdisciplinary as we've developed, uh, as the project has developed, and as I've gone through this uh, rabbit hole, let's say. And we had two institutions, we, we have two institutional per, uh, partners. We've started with the Cambridge Group for the History of Population and uh, Social Structure. Um, it was not from day one. Um, again, by the way, I'm giving you some insider information, and that's by design. It's not like um, um, I'm just. I want to give you some information about how we can run a large scale project with or without partners. Therefore, uh, this project is, this presentation is, half of it is about the project, the other half is about the findings of the project. But I think running a project is something also to be shared. I think this information can be, can be helpful. Okay, so in, when I applied for the grant, um, the, the Scientific and Technological Research Council of Turkey, uh, Tübitak, in, this encouraged me. Uh, to have a partner. And I was hoping to have Cambridge Group for the History of Population and Social Strikes, a very important institution. I mean, two esteemed scholars have established uh, this uh, research group. Um, and uh, one of these two colleagues uh, is um, Tony Wrigley, and he was knighted for this. So, I mean, he is Sir Wrigley because he has established the group mainly, uh, and Peter Laslett is the geographer. But uh, Tubitak discouraged me to have them on board because they thought that that will decrease my chances for application. But in any case, so I couldn't have them in the application procedure. But after I had the grant, I've just include them as a partner. And we worked very closely with this group uh, and especially under the leadership of the director, Lee Shaw Taylor for the first three years. And then we started to move towards more to geospatial humanities. And then that is also kind of resulted in that we, uh, very, we divorced very, in a very civilized manner with the Cambridge group for this reputation and social structure. And then, established a new partnership with the School of Geographical and Earth Sciences from the University of Glasgow. And it is kind of also shows the shift uh, in the project in the second half towards geospatial data science. And we are still trying to reach that goal. We are not there yet. But that's in a nutshell what the project is about. And we've got a web page. It is mentioned underneath every slide, so you will not miss it. Uh, but there is a, Kerem has nicely mentioned that he has visited our offices. I just counted the total number of people who worked in the project. I think we are now, we, more than 60 people were involved due to several reasons. Uh, one of which we, is the fact that we had 1.2 million euros. And the um, second reason was that uh, we had a 
a necessity to enter large amounts of data. And for that, you have to really build up teams and Cochineers to host us quite well. He's been hosting us quite well. We had five offices and uh, some of them were very really busy offices. And I'm really glad uh, to the entire collaboration uh, of the team. So this is quite important for us. This is a teamwork. I mean, in our case, you can have also ERC grants with three people is also possible, especially in other fields, uh, but in a social science and humanities project, uh, especially in history project, it is possible that you can have a large team and there are some advantages for that, I would say. So the team is there. These are the new project advisors. Anna Bashiri, she's a professor of geospatial data science in Glasgow. Professor Elif Sertal, uh, she is a professor in geometrics and uh, expert in remote sensing as well. And I'll mention Grigor's name a couple of times. He's been very influential for me and for the development of the project. We are still collaborating and co-publishing. Right now, he's a member of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. And Lee, I mentioned his name already, and um, from Cambridge. Campop is the short name of the Cambridge Group for the History of Population and Social Structure. Murat Güvenç was very important for us to get the grant because he was really helping with the grant preparation and also submission and also in the early stages, in the first three years, we've been using uh, his methodology quite uh, centrally. Then we've got some postdoctoral research fellows. Yekta has just left the project, but I will mention his name and I really want to keep him there as an affiliated researcher for a while. He's a computer scientist. Pete to the right, uh, Pete, Petrus Johannes Gilles, uh, was our GIS person, and he's been uh, very, he was one of the pillars of the project, and I think we've learned together a lot, and uh, I'm eternally thankful to him, and I'll show you some results that we've managed with him, and he is one of the co-architects of this uh, project, thanks to his efforts. There are some new colleagues, Pari has just joined. She is an expert in remote sensing and especially with satellite uh, imagery and signal processing. We, will, we may talk a little bit about that later on. And other colleagues are here. I just want to show you that now it's a small group, uh, Osman and Akin. Uh, they are now affiliated researchers. Uh, I'll also mention their name in a minute. But we are now still moving uh, in the last year. We are hoping to get um, other colleagues from other disciplines. With Patreon, we have some ideas to work on uh, super resolution and other issues. Ugar was also influential uh, for the preparation of the data sets. Jenaida, equally important person for us for the structure of the project. So thanks to her, we had a running computer back end. And FA is one of my PhD students. OK, that's the team. I just wanted to show you that. Now I'm going back to the presentation. And so. Briefly, something I think we should define digital humanities a little bit. I mean, it's difficult to really put the name on it and um, really differentiate uh, the methodology here, but I think we have to do this. Um, in Turkish, uh, we even lack the name. Uh, so there are several versions, uh, even there is no one single uh, version which has established itself. Uh, is the version, but um, this field is really here to stay. So, the, and we've got also an application of geospatiality in it. So it's digital slash digital geospatial humanities. So what can be the connection with the other studies? Uh, let me start from here. Um, our project's time period covers 1840 up until 2000. And there is a reason for that. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, uh, but, um, it is more, let's say, positioned within the Ottoman studies and then the Turkish Republic because the heavy lifting uh, methodologically is rather on the Ottoman side. Although time period wise, it's more to 20th century and less uh, the Ottoman uh, decades, but the heavy lifting methodologically is on the Ottoman side and we've spent 80% of our time rather on the Ottoman sources. And therefore, this connection is important, especially for the Ottoman studies. And I'm an Ottomanist, uh, or I'm an economic historian working on the Ottoman Empire, uh, predominantly. Now, this generative aspect is key for the digital humanities. And what do I mean with this is that uh, this is not only a project that you start, work on it, publish things, and then stop. 
and then you've got wonderful things that you can put on your shelf. That's not the idea. So the idea is that, like I've just mentioned, the FAIR data principles, we want to create data sets and so that we can revisit our findings, improve them. So we are trying to create a loop. So we want to use our academic output as input for our own further academic research, but as well as and surely for the wider community. And that's this generative aspect of digital humanities, if, it, if it's done correctly, is a game changer. Uh, it's not only the medium of exchange or medium of results, it's not like you know, digital data sets instead of words on paper, but if you can use academic outputs as input, this really changes the dynamics a lot. And we are hoping to contribute to that aspect of the digital humanities. And one good example will come in a minute with Gregor's work. Now, at the same time, we personally in this project try to really follow this computational social science and humanities approach. What I'm trying to explain here is that I personally would would rather position myself in social sciences instead of humanities, conducting economic history in this part on, on this part of the world. And the real reason for this is that I do, I mean, this is a personal positioning and academic development and background and everything. I've studied economics in my undergrad, got my master's in economics, then switched to Ottoman studies in the PhD, and the economist in me is still somewhere there. Uh, and this replicability is a crucial thing for me. So I do want to continue to work on input, which can be data, and then interpret it, analyze it, think about it, put results. But those steps should be followed or could be followed by other researchers from my, from my taste. I mean, if you are, you don't need to go through this path, but I personally would like to have those results. So I was all, I've been, uh, computationally inclined, uh, and I was really also tempted by the quantitative history because of these reasons. And this fits not so badly with the generative aspect of digital humanities, so that you can uh, create data sets and explain the research question, and then follow a method and get to your results so that people can test it, or repeat it, or improve it, or prove that you are wrong. So these are the possibilities and probabilities. And that's related to data sharing uh, side of the project. Let me also show you from the project webpage that we also started to share data sets. So they are connected to publications, but if you're interested in this, I mean, if behind every data set here, there is a publication. So we've got, this is the data and then we follow the, we explain the methodology and we get the results. So that's that type of historiography is something that I would really like to contribute to. And I think if you are hosting, if you position yourself in this geospatial humanities, not a bad place to try to uh, conduct this kind of an academic exercise. Now, Ottoman studies, if you bring in the material now, we have massive problems about data creation. And I'll try to talk a bit more on this uh, in the second half of the talk. So data availability, data creation, that is a problem. And, and this project has been spending a massive proportion of time, effort, and money at the end on data creation. And so it is not only finding the documents, but making them commensurable, making them machine readable, making them operational. So that part of the story is called creation. So you've got the data sources, but whether you can use them as input into digital and geospatial humanities methodologies is the question. And that, is, that has been the bottleneck, or let's say the challenge of the project. And this was the challenge, in fact. Uh, so it is still the challenge. And I think this is not only an Ottoman studies, digitalization, geospatial humanities problematic. So wherever in which field, doesn't matter, I guess, if you want to employ digital geospatial humanities methods, 
this creation or data suitability, not availability, but suitability is the, is the challenge. And we've been struggling to deal with it within our project. Let me give you a bit more information about this. So we are this, this industry project. There are mainly two sources of information. One is texts. So this is textual informational retrieval. Sounds fancy, but it can be reading. You know, that a researcher can go to the archives, go through the catalogs, find documents and read it. It is textual information retrieval by a human being. So that's one source, you got the information. If you scale it a bit higher and the digital humanities has got this possibility in certain cases and most of the cases, if you ask me, I mean, in my field, scalability is the, is the advantage here. So if you really enlarge the scope and also the unit of analysis or the territory or whatever you wanna do it. So if you can scale it up, then automatization is the way to go. So in our project, we, after spending quite a long time on manual data reading entry into data sets, we've thought that now we can really try to move towards optical character recognition and furthermore, handwritten text recognition for Ottoman scripts. And that was, I think, after the third year, in the second half of the project, let's say, we managed to start about the HDR. Uh, this word doesn't really exist, but this is handwritten digital recognition. And that was important for us. And I'll try to give you an ex example for this. The other source that we mainly use are maps. And that is also a kind of an information retrieval. And that is geographical, geospatial information retrieval. So historical maps and uh, what can you do with it? And how, you, how can you work on them? Either it is similar to reading documents. Either you take a look at them, get the information manually, or try to automize it along principles of replicability again. So instead of you use this map and got this information, and if you want to use the same map, you can find something else. We are trying to develop methodologies within the perspective of social sciences or science in general, so that these results can be replicable and also refutable, improvable, so that this output can be an input. And there, the material that we are using are maps, mainly, uh, but we've just started to work on aerial photos, and I'll, I'm hoping to finish this talk with what to do with the aerial photos and satellite imagery in a history project. Regarding the texts, uh, the materials are censuses. That's where you've got printed material and you can use OCR or handwritten documentation. And there you have to work on handwritten text recognition, which is HTR. But when you are working on these things in a large territory, we also needed something else. And that is the geospatial, geospatial aspect of the project. So we had to bring the information from different time layers to exact coordinates. So you have to georeference your findings if you want to go along the path that we are trying to go. So instead of just mapping the results, it was important for us that we are mapping them geospatially. So we had to really put the latitudes and longitudes of the findings. And I'll show you in a minute uh, what I'm trying to say with it. And this was the challenge. So we this mapping, the long title of the talk is coming from this need so for us, mapping is not just a visualizing the results. It is a tool for spatial analysis. Because in order to be able to map and examine things, you have to really develop some methodologies. And that was our idea. And in our case, 1840 is an early period because Ottomans did not start to map the economic and, geo economic and demographic data in mid 19th century. So here, we are trying to map the unmapped data so that we can analyze them following geospatial methodologies. Okay, now let's move to the why question. So why I'm bothered in this. And this is directly related to the team building. And in this talk, I would also like to go share with you the developments or the changes in the team building so that we can have an, so that I can share that experience with you as well. So I'm an economic historian. And I didn't have one research question. And normally you can have several of them, of course. But I mean, if you want to work on a topic for five years, especially if it's humanities, I mean, 
there are colleagues from Koch University, they are working on very specific things, variable technologies. I mean, there's a new starting grant, which has been announced, I think a couple of weeks ago at Koch University. And a colleague is trying to find an early warning system, biogradable device for uh, heart attacks. So that's the research question. You know, that is single one thing and that person wants to establish an early warning system to avoid uh, heart attacks. But in a special, you know, in a humanities project, one single research question can be done, but I didn't have that. So in my idea, the entire project, and I've been working on this in my previous project as well, and therefore it's kind of my research agenda is long-term regional differences in economic development. So that's what I'm really interested in. And this grant has allowed me to really try things to address this uh, massive, big agenda. But of course, you can create some research questions, and there are sets. And we try to find the variables to test those questions. And I've got four uh, major sets. And therefore, the urban occupations, OETR, this is urban occupations, Ottoman Empire, Turkish Republic. And it is not very much about the occupations in urban locations, but that's just an acronym. So, but I wanted to focus on urbanization because it is a proxy for economic development. So these research questions um, are inspired by the primary research questions within the field of economic history, not Ottoman studies. These are economic history research questions. Let me put them on. So, uh, this was inspiring for me to read studies, think about other places from the perspective of economic history and economic growth, and specifically on the regional differences of economic development. And then I was, of course, influenced by the literature, but with this project, we are hoping to contribute to the literature as well. So the idea is to work on the Ottoman studies, not for the Ottoman studies, but my point of departure was economic history. And I hope the point of delivery will be not on the studies, because I do hope that we can go beyond this disciplinary divides. And these are the major research questions that we've been tackling. Uh, and this I knew in the beginning. So this was clear. Transport, not so much, I admit, but uh, urbanization, industrialization, agrarian change was there. And therefore, the idea was to bring the sources. What can we do with them? And these are important questions in economic history, as I've said. Urbanization, changes in population densities are proxy data for economic development, which is very meaningful and helpful for Ottoman studies because for several issues, you don't you just lack the data. And industrialization, similar here. Uh, occupational history is key. There are studies there for the Cambridge group, structural change of employment, which means which percentage of a certain location is working on the fields, in the field, in the sector of agricultural production, and which percentage is working in manufacturing in workshops, and which percentage is working in services. And how does that change is a proxy for industrialization. So there is an ongoing debate how to assess uh, uh, industrialization as a movement in output, but it can also be a movement within the employment. So these are detailed industrialization questions, but they are there. So these are uh, agenda setting questions. Agrarian change, definitely there as well. And therefore I was interested in sources to get this information from that. So urbanization, industrialization, agrarian change and transport are the key things that we would like to have a better understanding of from 1840 until 2000. Right, 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 yes, okay. And these are, for these questions, you need sources and also data which can be measurable, not only commensurable, but you also have to be able to measure population density, sectoral distribution of occupations, share of export-oriented cultural production, transport costs. So this is a quantitative methodology. And all for all those things, we have to have that. And what kind of sources do we have? Then this is, this is a source-oriented project, surely conducted and also designed within the limitations of source availability. So you can start from, you know, it can be a source-oriented project or request research. This has been a problem-oriented. 
and point of departure were the research questions. And then you look for sources and that sources set also for you to go back and uh, find your research questions, surely. But the period of study is set by these research questions. And in order to achieve, achieve this goal, you need representativity. So it is for me not, not, not that viable to find individual merchants or farmers or drivers, uh, caravan uh, operators. I want to have a larger scale. And for that, you need universal coverage. I'll get into this in a minute. But uh, so I do, case studies, is, normally we work with case studies uh, in history, but they are not, you cannot add case studies for the representativeness of um, larger uh, territory. And this representativeness is the key. And that was the challenge again for us. So. That takes you to 1840s. To the best of my knowledge, um, there are earlier attempts to come to population and economy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But at least in its planning, maybe not in its implementation, but at least in its planning, this universal coverage. Let's register all the population. Let's count down the total of taxable incomes per household for the entire empire, at least in its goal setting, is a mid 19th century development. So the statistical mania in Europe comes in to the Ottoman state in mid 19th century, 1840s mania. 30s starts, but real things 1840s and 1880s. But so therefore it's the beginning point because before that it is not possible to have this uh, mentality of covering the entire population or entire economy. So that was the set. And then you switch to censuses. And for the Turkish case, the last census was conducted in 2000. Therefore, the period is 1840 to 2000. The last population census was in year 2000 for Turkey. We've started with Turkey, but uh, immediately it became clear that we can include uh, major parts of Southeastern Europe as well. And Bulgaria became a constitutional, I mean, constituting part of this project. And I'll, we'll get it in a minute, uh, some visualizations on this. Massive problems uh, for this because these sources, tax registers and population registers, to be specific, are not cataloged. I think such a word exists. I've double checked this internet. People use this. This catalogization is very problematic to have samples if you want to go for a larger territory. That was one problem. And the second one was. The data is, especially from 1840s, and we've spent, as I've said, most of our time in the Ottoman part of the study, and at least half of our time, effort, and money on 1840s, because sources from the 1840s, because they are not tabulated, they are not standardized, and that was not easy to work that to, into an interoperable data set, and that, that took us some time. And lastly, we had to really put those data economic and demographic data to exact locations. And that was also not that easy. But this was the challenge. And then the problem was to how do you work on this individually based Ahmed bin Mehmet butcher living in a village to in 1840. In his household, let's say we have five people and only males are registered. How do you make it commensurable so that you got this detailed micro level individual based per data in economy and demographic life of that territory or that point, that village, that neighborhood with a census data from the 20th century. And that was really the making or breaking point of this project. And that was the challenge. So that was the methodological challenge that we have to overcome. Uh, now I will switch to QGIS, and I'll try to show you some maps. Uh, again, if, you, if there are any problems, uh, please let me know. I've already created some screenshots from the QGIS, and I can go back to the PowerPoint, but I would like to show you the QGIS platform of the project. Now, so as I've said in the project, uh, in the beginning, uh, we, uh, let me show you this first. So for example, this census part of the story in the 20th century is a census making uh, century for the Turkey and census making means also map making. 
And I will not show you the Bulgarian part uh, of the project, uh, but in Bulgaria, it starts earlier, uh, early independence. Uh, so starting from 1880s, we've got good data could be matched with mappable units, which means you can map agricultural production, demography, and also occupations onto smaller mappable wonderful units in Bulgaria. For that, you have to wait in Turkey up until 1927. The very first censuses are coming, real censuses, I mean, okay, agricultural census from 1909 in the Ottoman case, but they are problematic to map and even the data that they acquired are problematic. So in the Turkish case, they start from 1927. Uh, and what you see here is the um, spatial segregation of that data, which means these are all uh, sub-districts. I call them sub-districts in Turkish, it is ilçe. But in 1927, they used to work with the, uh, they used to, uh, they were used, they were using the um, Ottoman intern, which is Kaza. In 1935, they switched, but in, uh, we are talking about Kazas. So in the beginning of our project, my idea about um, unit of comparison, or unit of operation, was a Kaza. Kaza is one of those polygons there in the language of GIS. So for 1927, we've got an agricultural census, an industrial census, and the very first population census. So it is possible for you to spatially disaggregate this national data into units. This is about 450 in year 1927. So we start from here. So in the censuses, if you've got the matching data, it is, diff it is not that difficult to work with GIS or um, let's say, spatial methodology, because it then what you are doing is georeferencing some uh, territory. And then uh, you've got some attribute tables. I can switch on, but you don't need to. Um, some of us are very familiar, I guess. I've just seen the participants. List. There are experts in the field uh, who are here. I'm very glad. I've attended the GIS course uh, taught by uh, Professor Roosevelt, uh, and it was really helpful. And thanks to that connection, we managed to also recruit uh, Pete. He was my assistant. I have always liked to say this because I was a student. He was my TA. So I was just attending and auditing the course uh, as a normal uh, student. And in this very early stage of the project, what I was hoping was to map and spatially analyze very basic data coming from the uh, maps. So. What we've been doing in the team, Uyghur and Pete, they had their teams, and Uyghur was trying to get the census material from OCR, optical character recognition. Pete had his team, so they were georeferencing the maps so that we can, let's say, do this for also 1935, for example. 1935 is a good year to georeference because in 1937, 38, and 39, you got for every year, for almost uh, all the important uh, cultural products, 14 in total, you've got per casa, per ilche, total area of cultivation and total volume of production. This is crucially important for export-oriented cultural question. So we had this, oh, 1935, very important day to have it. Then we had 1955. And uh, for occupational uh, data, 1935 is also important census. And then 1970 is a key year, same thing. Now their total number increases, but this is the unit uh, sub-district sub as a unit. And you've got also spatially, high spatial resolution data in 1970, especially based on provinces, but this was the key element uh, in the beginning. So my idea in the beginning was our idea, but I mean kind of my idea in the beginning was that, uh, so we have this, how can we get representative data on the Kazas, selected Kazas, in selected regions from the mid 19th century? And there we are getting into this challenge of finding representative data so that we can make comparisons on the level of Kaza or Ilche, subdistrict in English, starting from 1840. And that is the bottleneck. So that is the, let's say, um, and I had this question in the, in, if you apply for the ERC, there is an interview, and that was the most difficult question I was expecting. And they've asked this question: say, what do you do with this? So you've got household-based individual data, then you want to compare it with censuses. What do you want to do? And this was a struggle. And we've spent a good two years to think about the solution. We think we found it, 
but you will be the judge. So we've got this data for several other periods, as I've said. I mean, I've just, I'm just showing you selected years, but we have also 2000 and 1990. But then how can we have this representative data sets then uh, for uh, earlier periods? And there, let me switch to this. So we can also change the background a little bit so that it shows a bit better. So then the idea was to look for regions. And uh, I'm from Ankara, from Polat, and I'm not a nationalist, but Ankara was the first region, region number one. And in the archives, Ankara Temetwat registers, these are the text registers from the 19th century, also recorded it number one. But anyway, so this was our region number one. And yellow points represents to the cities that I was thinking about working on. So this is Ankara. Then the second region has Bursa. Third one, we've moved to Bulgaria, Plovdiv, and then Luce. These were the first four regions. And I thought we should get representative data for these regions. And therefore, in Ankara, we had terrible mistakes. I will not get into them, but we couldn't surround Ankara for any other reason. That's mainly the data availability because for these locations, Bay Pazarı, Ayash, Nalluhan, we had better data for 1930s, but that was the first region and I'm not really happy with that result at all. But then in Bursa, we had Mudanya as well, Gemnik and the Iznik. So my idea was to, okay, let's get the economic and demographic information from these locations. So let's put the names to those places. So the project has got now in nine regions in total and trying to match that, uh, the rural part became the issue. And although you read uh, as an economic historian of the Ottoman Empire that the Ottoman Empire is a rural economy, if you don't make your hands dirty, you don't see how limiting that factor, that fact is. In the Ottoman studies, we know most about Istanbul, which is the least representative location for the Ottoman Empire. So studies have been on Istanbul because of the source availability and there's a terrible bias in this. We know most about a city which says almost nothing about other urban locations, forget the rural locations. Therefore, I was really happy that we can work on other urban locations. But to be honest, the share of the population in the cities is so few. If you think about trying to compare a large territory, uh, it is, terribly problematic to focus on urban locations. Therefore, we were trying to really get the rural economic and demographic dynamics into the picture to be able to reach uh, representative data locations for larger territories, casas, uh, ideally. So we said, okay, we should really work on this. Uh, and then I've selected with the help of Grigor Boykov, uh, who was a member of the project. And then he, moved first to his own project. And that's his project. And he had a Marie Curie research project running in Turkey. Unfortunately, he couldn't finish it. Maybe unfortunately for me, because we've been collaborating well, but fortunate for him because he got a job in Vienna and he moved, but he continued to um, support the project and become, a, I mean, he continued to not only support the project, but work for the project uh, with this project. I'll get into a bit more details on this in a minute here. So I was hoping to get representative places in regions such as Filipe, we can zoom into these places. Black dots represent these villages from for which we've acquired data, which means our team just uh, worked in these archive, I mean, worked in these offices and, and read from the Ottoman Rica documents of tax registers and the population registers and typed in into customized uh, data entry tools uh, per household economic and demographic information. And I was hoping that uh, by using these, let's say so many villages here in Ankara or so many villages in Bursa, to say something about the region of Bursa, because we would have the city, Bursa, then selected towns around it, Mudanya and Gemnik here and Iznik, and then some villages that I've chosen. So this is normally, if a historian samples, they sample like this. And it's 
It's not the best way of sampling. I mean, you can call it stratified sampling, clustering sampling, this and that, but it is not really sampling if you ask a statistician. So in these places, I mean, especially in Plovdiv, I've asked my colleague Grigor and also other colleagues in Bursa, for example, okay, let's find four villages which became villages from 1840s until today. Let's find places which vanished. Let's find places which became a part of the urban structure. So that was my idea about categorizing villages and then try to get 10 to 15 of them and then get the data and analyze it. And that's wrong from my perspective. I mean, it's wonderful information. So let me switch to the PowerPoint presentation and give you an account on that. So, sorry, I've got my Zoom thingies here. Okay, so let me give you the number, yeah. So before the sample, we had economic and demographic data of around 70,000 individuals in 20, 29 locations. I mean, this is unprecedented, terrible waste of time, we can also say, but this is unprecedented because if you want to work on a location in a dissertation with a personal effort, you can cover at most two cities. But in our case, it was possible for us to really get exact detailed information, we transcribed everything from the Temetrat register. We didn't leave anything out. In the population case, we did a bit selective data entry. We can talk a little bit on that. On purpose, I didn't type in, we didn't type everything in. But for all these locations, without the villages, in tax registers, we reached almost 70,000 people. And in the population registers, more than that because you've got more people registered in households in the population registers compared to the tax registers. But then we've had then the samples, the numbers in parentheses are the total number of individuals covered in these villages in those regions. And it was a failure. And with Gregor, we've been really thinking together, I was saying, this is not working. So, and with uh, Cambridge group, uh, Lee said, no, this, this, this sample is not representative because you got the bias. So I choose the city, I choose the towns, and on top of that, I also choose the villages and there is no representability in this. So it was not possible for us to continue with this in this large scheme of the project. So we had to find another way of representative sampling. And there you move into geospatial humanities a bit more and try to reach geospatial um, methodology. And let me go back to that. So we've changed the sample then, and we moved to a geo-sampled selection for five locations. I'll, I think I've got about 10 minutes, but we are on time. And this is, I think, and I'm not saying it's an accomplishment, but it was a solution to our problem. And we will find out whether it is an accomplishment or not, but that was a solution to our sampling problem. And in this replicability, computational social sciences aspects is, instead of going, following Erdem's choices, in this geospatial sampling, we had a methodology and set rules to get a representative sample of uh, rural locations. And this was, I think, the solution for our project. Now, how do you do it, is the question. How do you pick? I've got these numbers uh, almost exact. So then we move to not to a region like Erdem's choice. So we said, okay, let's stick to the mid 19th century Ottoman administrative division. Let's go for a Sanjak. Then we pick Hudabin Digar Sanja in 1840. There are 597, if I'm not mistaken, locked settlements in the Sanjak of Hudab in Digyar. We did the same for Ankara, Ankara Sanja, Saruhan Sanja. And in Bulgaria, we followed a different path. This was in the beginning, it's not that really Sanjak based, but for Ankara, Bursa, Manisa, and Edirne, we followed in Edirne, it's 90%, we followed the Sanjak boundaries. And we have, we found the method to select 5% of all the population living in one Sanjak, and also in the 5% of the total number of settlements. And that's the geosampling method uh, that I'm happy with. 
so we continue to do this for in total uh, four regions and it's a time consuming exercise uh, let me show you how we find the way about the sampling strategy so it's a random sampling first of all and in order to be able to do that we had to geolocate all of the settlements in a region so you had to go through the other population registers find historical maps find those locations in those historical locations and then put them with the coordinates and thanks to pete and his team we've established a geospatial database and Grigor was working for the project back then and he just got these two places i mean in, i think in plovdiv he just geolocated 404 uh, locations and around 300 in russia it should be 290 something locations and he has managed to look at all the all the locations registered in the population uh, register so this is like 100 percent coverage or very close to 100 percent coverage in all these regions so we had to really pinpoint all of these um, places um, in other population registers to sample from then in our sampling it is called um, ahp uh, and uh, uh, this is a hierarchical process is in it, in it, and in this we've got three components. We have to want, we want to get the five percent of the population, but we also want to, to sample these places according to a cultural suitability. And for that, you need digital elevation models because the data of cultural suitability is mainly coming from ruggedness and elevation, and that is. Uh, we used the freely available shuttle radar topography mission data from 2000. And I'm really uh, grateful to Chris as well, uh, because I, mean, I talked about that uh, through the steps uh, in that. So the data is from 2000, we've got that recognized. Then we've also contacted soil scientists uh, from Adiyaman and Haran universities, and they also allowed us to work with the soil quality. So we've also sampled the locations according to agricultural suitability based on uh, soil quality, in addition to remote sensing data, which is uh, mainly SRTM. And lastly, we wanted to get also this connectivity aspect. So we wanted to sample locations, let's say Hudave and Digar Sanja or Edirne. Around in Edirne, you've got also around 600 locations. Which places do you pick is the question. So we also said that, okay, let's categorize the locations according to the connectivity. And for that, we had to work on historical maps. So we found, um, I think, a good stream map. Spent quite a time, quite, quite some time on it. But when we're edit, so instead of just focusing only the regions that we are uh, working on, so the idea was to really, okay, let's get as much as we can almost. So it solved our Balkan problems. And we can, if there are questions, we can talk on this, but these are the categories of roads from 1900, roughly. But for Turkey, I could, we couldn't find a really a good match. Uh, and for that, this is anachronistic in a regard, but we had to really move to 1940s. So we had this historical uh, map. So what you see here is, in fact, blood, sweat, and tears of a group. So we've managed to georeference, and we've spent 1,500 maps only to this greenish, uh, yellowish uh, part on the Balkans, and a bit less on the Turkish part. Uh, but we managed to get this core region covered so that we can sample. And similarly, so we have the soil data for the six regions that you see here. Ankara, Bursa, Manisa, Edirne, Ruse, Plovdiv. Uh, but then we are edit, thanks to also um, Grigor's project, we also managed to get a beginning of a gazetteer word. So what I'm saying is, so we managed to georeference in fact, this is even better, a large number of locations. This is the very first Ottoman Gazetteer on this scale. I'll give you exact numbers, therefore I will switch again to the PowerPoint. Sorry about that, but it will, we will get there in a minute. Yeah, so this is the total number of locations we've referenced. 
When we had this capacity, instead of just working on the regions, we said, okay, let's cover territory. And therefore it starts from Istanbul. We've got a hole in Istanbul, Istanbul is not covered, but we managed to get georeferenced. Okay, we, we managed to get information of total population for around, let's say 18,500 places. We managed to get roughly a bit more about the 16,000 of them georeferenced. And it covers around 1 million households and two and a half million males are registered in these places. And if you double that, so we are talking about five million. So this is the population geography for mid 19th century Ottoman Empire. And on this scale, I think uh, uh, that hasn't been done before. So you can map it per Sanjak or Kaza or in other respects, but I mean, the beauty of this is that you can zoom in and try to map issues, but we need this for the regions to sample. But then we had edit. So we said, okay, let's do this for Western Turkey and Southeast Europe. So this was necessary for uh, the geosampling effort. Okay. Now, uh, in our study, so we did these things to solve this problem. So we, we've been, it wasn't a choice, if you ask me, or a luxury to employ digital humanities methodology in this project. We had to. So there is no way to deal the research question or the agenda that I was hoping to deal with following uh, conventional methods. So it was for us, I mean, in the, in the grant application, we didn't have this. So we just didn't have these aspects. So let me, I'm, I'm wrapping up by the way. So let me go back to the PowerPoint presentation and remind you the research questions. All that we had it in our minds in the beginning, in the grant application procedure, but we didn't have these. It was not in our, it was not even, I never thought about this. I wasn't capable of thinking about those possibilities because I just lacked the information, geosampling, uh, and uh, spatial aggregation or disaggregation. So these came with the project. And we've also employed, since you got this material now, this interdisciplinarity came later, especially in the third and the fourth year, it was possible for us to, to run regression examinations and analysis. And also developed some methodologies. Um, just a bit, maybe you've been hearing, but someone is taking my door, but should be okay in a minute. I'm really sorry about that. So these are the, let's say, editions of our uh, project. Uh, and um, so we were not aware of these new methodologies. And uh, I would like to also hint on the publications of the project. Uh, where you can see examples of these, um, new methods. And that was our journey uh, within the project. So let me go back to that slide. Uh, this is where we stand for the time being with this project. We've got one more year to go. And these are the methodologies we would like to further pursue further. And I'll stop here and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ardam Hocam. Uh, thank you for this uh, stimulating talk about, in general, uh, the tools and perspectives of uh, digital humanities and, in particular, stories, methods, and findings of your uh, project, Urban Occupations. Uh, you actually gave us uh, a lot to intellectually absorb, let's say. Uh, and now the floor is open uh, for uh, questions. And, and uh, as the moderator of the talk, with the permission of our audience, I would like to benefit from my privileged position and uh, perhaps ask the uh, first question. And it's about the uh, time frame of the project. I mean, when we, look at, when we look at the title and description of the project located in the website, we see that the 
time frame for your project is uh, from 1850 to 2000. But for your presentation, I understand that your studies covers the period from 1840s on. So uh, just for a clarification, at uh, what point of your project you decided to include 1840s and uh, why is it because of certain developments that you need to uh, thought about or certain sources that became available? Sure. Uh, thanks. I probably have gone too fast there. I mean, 1850 is just uh, rounding it up. Uh, the crucial date for me is 1844, 1845. Uh, because in 1844, 1845, we've got um, which can be translated as uh, income yielding assets. This is a translation from Hurije and Istanbulu. And only starting from 1844 and 45, it's a huge year. Uh, we've got reliable, workable data on agricultural production, income sources, occupation of households. And demographic data starts a little bit early, but it's also from 1840s. So it starts from 1840s. I, I didn't want to call 1840-2000. I've just called it 1850-2000. But the starting point is determined by the sources. Uh, and uh, that's Temit Duat registers plus Audible population registers. Thanks for that question. Any questions from our audience? You can uh, type your questions on the chat box. By the way, we are not big friends of this type of Q&A, but um, that's the age of Zoom and that's the normal uh, format. So uh, I wish we had the chance to talk about it, but uh, if, you, if there is anything unclear, I'm sure there should be things which are not clear, but if you want to, me to ask, if you want me to click on other things on the QGS platform, please. Because at the end of the day, uh, I do hope to, Thanks to Pete, I hope. Uh, we would like to have one visualization and that will be just one interactive uh, uh, JS-based data visualization. So if it's that part was too fast, I would be very happy to get your uh, questions. Um, we have a question yeah. from uh, Fukunai. So Fukunai asks, uh, says, I would like to kindly ask sure. you that how did you overcome difficulties of gathering economic data occurred by changing settlement boundaries? Thank you very much. This is a crucial question. So it was easy to, this is the reason why we've been sampling and pointing. Uh, also think about, if you could think about Administrative changes is surely very uh, problematic. In spatial uh, methods, uh, there are some solutions to this. So it is technically possible to, Kriging is one word for that. We've been not doing that. We've been not doing that. So it's possible for uh, to uh, adapt the changes in the territory. Uh, spatial disaggregation is, uh, is possible. You can do that. But we didn't want to go beyond that and reach that level of data manipulation. So what we've been doing until now was mainly using the administrative boundaries, let's say administrative boundaries from 1935, for example. You can pick any other. In Bulgaria, it's even better. We've got more dates. But let's, let's think about we are making a comparison of uh, Ilce Nidufer in Bursa, any place where in 1935 had a certain administrative border. So we used that border mainly. And then since we've got point data from the Ottoman Empire, for example, if you want to make a comparison between population density of any Ilce, Nilüfer, Polatlı, wherever, we are using the empty polygon of the border to put it on the map and then put all other dots coming from the mid 19th century settlements and then calculate the total population through those individual settlements. So you've got a total population for 1840s for that territory. So it was always, it has been for us always possible to compare 
any given year in a census with pre-census Ottoman data. So our temporal comparisons are very solid for the periods between 1840 and any census year. If you want to make comparisons from census year to census year, then the problem that you are addressing is more difficult to solve. I hope I could explain this. Just a second. I'm here and listening. Okay, so uh, I mean, perhaps I can um, continue uh, with the question. I mean, I can elaborate on this uh, question uh, in a way. Uh, I mean, I said you had, a, you had this stimulating presentation and all this discussions, research outcomes, indeed highlight all the angles and contributions that digital humanities can make to our field. But uh, while listening to your presentation, it left me wondering about the limitations of tools utilized by uh, digital humanities. In, in your experience, are there any limitations or weaknesses of the digital humanities uh, projects, particularly in terms of how we understand uh, history, how we understand long-term changes, changes or developments in broader uh, geograph geographies? And did you address any of these uh, weaknesses or limitations in your own project or how did you address them? I mean, Surely there are limitations and structural limitations, and this is mainly data incompatibility that we've encountered um, in other projects uh, has had other issues. But in our case, and especially with um, geospatial humanities, digital humanities methodologies, I think the problem is that this anachronism or the time difference between the methodology and the data. I mean, this data suitability is a crucial thing as an historian, you have to really be aware of the limitations of the data sets, et cetera, et cetera, and that's definitely the case. But if you want to employ cutting edge new technology, uh, especially in humanities, this compatibility is a burden that you want, you really have to be aware of the problems that you are uh, creating when you are trying to solve your problems. Um, a good example can be our sampling method that I really highlighted. I mean, this is the first sampling method uh, that I came across uh, in Audubon studies. Uh, and there are problems there. I mean, uh, for example, I've just shown you the three components are there, population, transport, uh, and agricultural suitability. And with the population, we are quite happy because it is from 1840s and we've done our best to geolocate places and our georeferencing ratio is a success. So we are happy with it. But uh, I've already mentioned this during the talk, uh, but uh, the ruggedness data is from 2000. So we know that in certain places, this is Anthropocene. So we changed the earth and the total volume of beton and autobahn construction and dams and everything. So it is the least of our concerns, to be honest. So for example, there, you cannot have a digital elevation model uh, for mid 19th century. There are attempts for uh, 1950s. Technically, you can go back probably not earlier than 1950s, but I mean, for example, even there, with a better fix, because then you are, you are using the, uh, digital elevation model more exact for the mid 19th century. But for certain locations, 100 years between 1840 and 1950 will be still very problematic. In our case, it is very problematic, but it is our first step. And this is the generative aspect. We do this, if we get better data, you will just take that out and plug the better data set in there. With the soil data, we got an even larger pro problem because the soil data is coming from 1970s. So this anachronistic set of data in the modeling is a problem. This is definitely the limitation that you have to work on. And this is just two ex a few examples, but I think the you can be really tempted to use your spatial humanities. It also creates a fake or let's say it's, create, it's an illusion of um, precision because the end result is very precise. So you can calculate the population density of a period of a place in 1840 and you will get an exact number. 
But that exactness can be an illusion. And it is, in fact, a model. And it's an approximation. So if you follow this path, you should be aware of the discourse that you employ as a researcher. It's not, it's not historians talk. It is the modeling talk of a social scientist. But to be honest, with historians talk, we have to also be very careful in this regard. But then you should be self-aware of this um, illusion of precision that I would like to highlight. Thank you. And we have another question from uh, Grigor Boyko. He says, Grigor says, uh, Erdem, many thanks at the beginning of the talk. Uh, you mentioned that you intend to end it by talking about the potential of uh, satellite imagery and aerial photography. Uh, can you please elaborate on this now? I will, and thank you very much for that question. Sorry for switching my camera off for a while. Uh, this is zooming at home with kids and someone needs to sleep and I have to move from one room to another room and I ask for your understanding but I am, I have the feeling that this can be also the case for several among us. Thank you very much for your patience. And I think I managed to move to a new location. Yeah, I mean, Grigor is an insider, as I said. But at the same time, we made some progress after he has left the project. And I'm really uh, glad for this question. And I will elaborate on it in two minutes, if it's possible, Kera. So I think a PowerPoint will surface here, but I want to show you what we want to do with uh, that material. Now, after working on this sampling things, this is what, I think this is where we stand for the time being. But now, this unit of analysis as a Kaza, Ilche, small territory is not very satisfying, to be honest, because it lacks the regional different diversification and regional differences in the territory. So I do hope to go to the locations, individual settlements as a unit of examination, which means instead of trying to aggregate the mid 19th century data to the level of polygons from the census years. I hope we can follow this is a little bit GIS talk, but the idea is to instead of just sample things up and find the economic and demographic data on a territory, we now want to break down the territorial data into points because it's easier and more reliable to compare points to points. What I'm trying to say here is that let's stick to Polatdor Nidifer instead of working on a place where you've got 40 villages, now the idea is to really work on individual villages. Since we have already 18,000 of them, okay, 16,000, it's fine. So we've got 16,000 places. With the area of photography and satellite imagery, the idea here is then to try to get roughly important dynamics for individual locations, such as total area of cultivation or total volume of production. So that's that's the idea. So where we want to do, what do we want to do with this is that this territory has been covered with, uh, so we, we've continued to work on this, in fact. So this is 1840s. And this is, we've continued to produce some gazetteers for Turkey. Uh, this is 1935, all Turkish locations in our, let's say, Western Turkey. Then we, we continue to do this and we have now 1855. And then we've got 1970 and 1990. So now we've got individually total population of these locations. This can be just dots for people who are not interested in the topic, but this is crucially important if you want to conduct studies per individual locations. And uh, this is a gazette here. In European Union countries, including Bulgaria, these gazetteers are ready. They are produced by nation, I mean, state institutions. In Turkey, we don't have an historical gazetteer. So our idea now is to match this, like 1990, find the satellite imagery of these locations, and then zoom into these places and find out the total area of cultivation or urbanization, 
changes in land use and land cover for 1990, 1970, and maybe even with the aerial photos going back to 1950. So that's our idea about finding the total share of the urban territory compared to rural one, not on one single territory, which has 50 villages in it, but work on village by village from starting from mainly from 1950s up until 2000. That's that's the idea. Thanks for that question. I can perhaps continue with uh, another uh, question or two, perhaps. I mean, uh, such a large project uh, obviously did not emerge from uh, nowhere. It was built upon many years of experience in various research projects and your studies in the field of economic and uh, social history. And uh, I assume similarly uh, the extensive experiences that you gained from urban occupations will turn into a, a sort of an infrastructure for your uh, future uh, studies. So in this context, perhaps I have uh, two, let's say, future-oriented uh, questions. Uh, one, uh, could you please elaborate on the experiences that you gained in the project and how you think you might benefit from them? in the uh, future. And uh, two, uh, did the project raise new questions that may become the basis for your uh, new research projects in digital humanities or economic and social history of uh, Ottoman Empire? Thank you very much, Emma. Great questions, surely. Starting from the last one, I mean, so I use this analogy now and then, but I mean, through this project, so it didn't start, as I said, it's a digital humanities project, it didn't. I was not aware of the, limit, the possibilities and limitations, and but I didn't apply to ERC to conduct this, I submitted my application in February 2015, and back then I was not aware of these possibilities, and the possible, some of them were not there either, uh, six years ago. Now, uh, one thing, I mean, in our project, we really, had to find these solutions to this question problem. I mean, the questions, research questions. And uh, one important uh, takeaway or lesson is that you can be very creative with your solutions, uh, but you have to peer review those results. So one of uh, my personal take in this is that I think one should, in Ottoman studies, one should think about more about co-authored interdisciplinary group work published more frequently and in larger venues than in the Ottoman studies. So I personally think we are trying to do it within our limitations, but um, ideas should be tested in our academic community. And if possible, trying to go beyond our villages, because as you know, we've got our, you know, we've got our tribes, so Ottoman studies, South Slavic, this and that. So if you can go beyond your own tribe, and a little bit pushing your comfort zone and try to publish in other fields journals, I think it's a good test. So that's what I've learned because you are not aware normally of your uh, mistakes and accomplishments. And this personal bias is always that, oh, wonderful. I mean, I had these Eureka moments, which didn't turn out Eureka moments. So first of all, if you try to new methods, I think one should be humble and tested uh, by other colleagues, especially from other disciplines. So this is one thing I personally take for the rest of my uh, research uh, uh, activity. Regarding digital humanities, this is here to stay, is my very firm belief. So I have this analogy like, you know, flat screen, mobile phone, automatic wash machine. This is the new humanities. So, I mean, these methodologies are transforming the way we conduct social sciences uh, and humanities, and they are here to stay. So you don't have to follow them, but one should be aware of the fact that this is not a fashion. Uh, there is a new way of conducting social sciences and humanities, and this new way will just improve further 
I don't think that they will be out of fashion anytime soon. So the geospatial and digital humanities methodologies are here to stay. And especially for the younger colleagues, I cannot uh, recommend more to be aware of them. It doesn't, you don't need to use them. You don't need to be a user, but one should be aware of the possibilities that they bring. I would answer this wonderful uh, question in this way. Mm. Eric, um, if there are uh, no other questions, um, perhaps uh, we can uh, stop here. Is there anything sure. that you want to add, Ardam Ojan? No, thank you very much. Thanks for the questions. Thanks for uh, asking them in chat. Um, thank you again for the participation. Uh, I would also like to... Uh, yes, please. Good. No, don't forget that uh, Daphne is waiting for you. Yes, yes, <laughs> of course. Uh, well, I would like to uh, thank you, first of all, for uh, sharing your uh, knowledge and experience uh, with us. I would like to thank uh, our audience for uh, being with us. I wish we could see them uh, as well, but it's the uh, Zoom. Um, and of course, uh, we would like to thank uh, Defne Hanım and Irem Hanım for organizing this talk on behalf of uh, Anamet and Danamet uh, Library. Uh, and I give the floor to Defne Hanım for uh, concluding remarks. Thank you very much, Erdem Hocam and Kerem Hocam, uh, for this talk. Uh, really seeing the back end of uh, a geospatial the humanities project is very valuable. Um, I believe that our audience really understood very well that it's actually not a very linear process, but it has many steps that needs to be considered. So thank you very much again for explaining thoroughly this project. Um, on that note, dear audience, uh, you may watch this talk shortly on YouTube and on SoundCloud. We will upload the recording of this talk. And before closing, I would like to inform you about our next talk, which will be on March 1st. Um, this talk, next, our next talk will be given by Marta Musso and Kirsten Arnold. And the talk will be about Archives Portal Europe, a new approach to the European archival heritage so um, there will be another talk about another project. Uh, and thank you very much again for the talk and for being here. Hopefully, uh, see you at our next talk. Goodbye.